What's up, friends? Welcome to Web3 Academy, a place for entrepreneurs, creators, and marketers to explore and learn how to use Web3 to transform business models and create thriving communities. Enjoy this next episode. GM, everybody. Welcome to Web3 Academy. It's the weekly roll-up. Jay Hamilton here coming at you from Whistler, Canada. It's spring. The sun is out. The flowers are blooming and the news is hot today. What's up, Kai? How you doing? I'm amazing. The news this past week is as hot as it is here in Pollo, Nicaragua. It's crazy hot. Uh, there's a mat, well, not massive, but there's a big swell here right now. So the waves are crazy. If I open up the door, you can actually just hear them slam the beach uh, every couple seconds. Uh, it's crazy here right now. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I'm stoked. This is a crazy week. So buckle up, everybody. We got a lot coming at you. Uh, Elon uh, looking to take free speech to Twitter uh, with a huge offer. We're going to talk about that. That just happened earlier today <laughs> before we started recording. Um, we're going to talk about uh, ETH and the merge uh, and the first top profitable blockchain. Uh, we're going to really dive into that. There's a lot that we think that everybody should be understanding around tokenomics and profitability as a blockchain uh, and what's happening with the merge. So you guys understand that. Um, then we're going to jump into some stuff around the metaverse, what's going on with the metaverse. A lot of people getting into that space. I'm sure everybody's hearing about it constantly. I want to make sure you guys are informed there. Um, and then we're going to wrap up with uh, uh, our protocol tool of the month. Uh, so lots of great, exciting news for you today. I think I might even have forgot a few things that we're going to mention. Yeah, there's I was so going to say, Board at Yacht Club, Coinbase. That's movie? right, I did. Movie, yeah. film? Movie? I don't know. We'll talk on that too. <laughs> So much coming, but before we get started, uh, let's just share some quick gratitude. Um, Kai, why don't you go first? What are you grateful for today? Ooh, what am I grateful for today? Um, I am grateful for um, our team at Impact Digital Marketing slash Web3 Academy. Um, we've, uh, we have a team of, I don't know what it is, eight or so at Impact Digital mm -hmm. Marketing. And uh, they just, we've seen some incredible growth from our team. Everyone is just doing some amazing things. Uh, our clients are doing incredible. Um, and uh, it's just really, really cool. We've never met any of them because we were all completely remote. And um, so one, it's really cool that we've just, we've made this sort of like um, this company with a bunch of people we don't know. We have a, a Zoom party tomorrow, which I'm excited for. And we just booked our first in-person meeting retreat in Portugal, uh, where the team's all going to get together in the summer and we're going to finally meet. And I'm just, I'm super, super stoked for that. That's right. So if anybody, anybody, uh, any listeners out there, if you're going to be in Portugal in August, hit us up. Uh, we'd love to, uh, to meet you, see you in person, maybe have you on the podcast. We can do an in-person podcast. Kyle and I have never even done an in-person podcast. Uh, so yeah, very exciting. I am grateful. I'm going to, I agree with everything Kai said, but I'm, I'm grateful for old friends. Uh, I've got a couple of old friends visiting. Um, it's just amazing when you haven't seen friends in years and then you meet up and you've never skipped a beat. There's just something about friendship that is um, so, so special. So very grateful Absolutely. for old friends. Uh, By the way, okay. we have a new gratitude section in the Discord, in our Discord channel. If you're not in right. our Discord, go join Web3 Academy Discord. It's in the show notes below. And we've got a, a bunch of new channels there. One of them is gratitude, and it's probably our hottest channel there is. Um, share some gratitude. We want to know. Yeah. Let's be grateful. Yeah, let's be grateful. Um, okay, before we jump into the news, Kai, drumroll, what's the Web3 word of the week? Gosh. Uh, it's mayhem. It's mayhem. Honestly, the word is mayhem because there's just so much going on right now in Web3. I feel like we're like, we're bottling up and we're about to have this like Cambrian explosion of things in Web3. Everything from like what's going on with Elon over there. I know that's not Web3 specifically, but like, I think it has implications for Web3 to actually all the things happening in Web3. It's just mayhem right now. Um, and it makes our job easy to present news because there's so much of it. So much news. Mayhem. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's take the mayhem and let's turn it into uh, some simple to understand sense for all of our listeners. Uh, and let's start with our first story. Uh, Elon Musk offering to buy Twitter. What's going on here, Kai? Yeah, so Elon bought nine point whatever two percent of twitter a couple weeks ago uh and then he was asked to or maybe i don't know if he was asked or he asked to go on the board 
Um, it got approved and then he shut it down. And then a week later after shutting down, uh, being a, taking a seat on the board, he offers this morning $43 billion offer to buy Twitter outright completely and take it from a public company to a private company. Uh, what, what's great is he actually offered $54 dollars and 20 cents i think it is per share mm -hmm. so he threw in the meme of 420 uh which is amazing <laughs> i freaking love elon um it's not a hostile takeover but it is kind of a hostile takeover i mean he basically wrote in his letter to the board uh if you scroll down a little yeah, bit here, Jay, here's the line right here my offer is uh, my best and final offer and if it is not accepted i would need to reconsider my position as a shareholder <laughs> he is absolute legend just legendary status right now he wants to buy this in cash it's like 43 billion dollars in cash just gonna buy it outright um i don't know what's gonna happen here but man i hope he gets it but we'll see he's got a good argument and he's giving a great offer and him removing his investment or selling his investment will probably make twitter stock tank um so we'll see. So the reason why this is happening, or not, not the reason, but one of the main reasons he's doing this is Elon is a big proponent of freedom of speech, right? Mm -hmm. And most social platforms right now are, um, are, are censoring content. Uh, and Twitter's going that way as well, especially with um, Jack Dorsey um, leaving um, the new board and the new CEO, I can't remember his name, um, but he is more known to be okay with censoring content. Mm -hmm. um, and Elon doesn't think that that should happen. And honestly, one of the things that I think, when I think of Twitter, it's different than a social platform. Like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok and all this stuff, like these are places for people to, I don't know, put up pictures and promote, you know, what they're doing and things. It's, it's, it's a social place. Twitter is different. It's almost like a communication platform for the world mm -hmm. is the way that I see it. It's like a lot of big thinkers, a lot of big companies, and it's where they just like actually communicate with one another. And if we ever like, let's think worst case scenario, got into this like, um, you know, uh, tyrant world where governments or whoever one person took over and like, just like blocked the internet, like what's happening in North Korea or China, et cetera. Like we wouldn't have a place to speak with everyone around the world. It would not exist. And I think Elon really wants that for Twitter. It's a place for us to communicate with anyone in the world and just have freedom of speech. And I'm pretty sure he's trying to do that. I feel like there's going to be other people who don't want this to happen, whether that's governments or it's, I don't know, the board of Twitter, but someone doesn't want this to happen, I'm sure, but we'll see what happens here. What well, as he think? says in his letter here, uh, let me just read a few lines. He says, I invested in Twitter as I believe in its potential to be the platform for free speech around the globe. And I believe free speech is a societal imperative for a functioning democracy. However, since making my investment, I now realize the company will neither thrive nor serve the societal imperative in its current form. Twitter needs to be transformed as a private company. Then he goes on to make the offer, which is uh, seems to be a very high offer. I mean, I'm not uh, an expert in the Twitter um, current price and their their off their their stock, but. He's offering something to 54% premium over the day before he began investing in Twitter. Um, and he basically, his last line is Twitter has ex extraordinary potential. I will unlock it. Now here's the, um, it, so we have another take that's here. Uh, Sam Bankman fried, who's the founder of FTX and, and one of the richest uh, people in the world as well. He put in a, a, he created this thread about decentralizing Twitter because it's very interesting. And it actually goes on to what we talked about. I think it was last week in the roll up when we were talking about lens protocol and, mm -hmm. um, and decentralizing social media, because here's the thing, it would be great for Elon to, you know, own Twitter and to take it private and to be able to, you know, uh, improve freedom of speech uh, and make sure that that stays around, but he, it's still a centralized entity. He still owns it. One person. Yeah, and if one, one day person. he wakes up and he decides that <laughs> he doesn't almost... want freedom of speech anymore, <laughs> yeah. um, he could change that. And so the idea of Web3 is to no longer have to trust one individual or one corporation. Although Elon is cool as hell and we like him and maybe he's going to support the ethos of what we want, it doesn't matter. The idea of Web3 is that we just don't ever want to have to trust anything regardless. And that's what the blockchain does and decentralization does is it allows us to just never have to trust, right? It allows it to just 
be and exist without <clears throat> asking for permission, without trusting anything. And so SBF here, he sort of gave his breakdown of like what could be possible with Twitter if we were to decentralize Twitter. Um, and so basically what he says is, um, so he, he kind of broke down some points. So one is tweets go on chain and encrypted. And so the sender chooses who has access to them and, and who can decrypt. So who can see the messages that they're putting? And he's like, basically this already exists. He's like, it's essentially your public tweets versus your DMs. He's like, now they would just be the same thing on the blockchain. You just choose if there's a privacy setting that only you know Jay can read a tweet um, or everyone can read a tweet or maybe only certain people who own a specific NFT can see a tweet. You could kind of decide who sees what. So there's privacy settings there and that's chosen through on-chain. So it can't be, can't be censored in any way. Um, okay. Then he went on to talk about monetization, um, which is interesting. And I don't know if this makes sense, but here's what he said. He goes, you can monetize in a few ways. One is at a tweet level. So the underlying, underlying protocol charges something per message. So he's like at 500 million tweets per day, which I assume is what's currently happening. It's like less than one cent or about a cent per tweet would replace half of Twitter's revenue. Um, 0 0.001 cent per tweet would replace their profit. Um, this, there's a couple cool implications here. Like if it was one cent per tweet, it's not really that big of a deal. Most, most people can afford that, not everyone, but some. Um, I guess there's two things here. One, it gets rid of bots, right? Because mm -hmm. who's gonna pay now to have these bots just tweeting and doing all these stupid things? Like the amount of engagement farming and like ridiculous tweets I get on Twitter, it's just, it's insane. This might help with that. The other problem is there are people in the world that one cent per tweet is, I don't want to say expensive, but could be, you know, mm -hmm. could dip into their um, access income. Um, and so does that get rid of freedom of speech? I was going to say, yeah. You... It's not like a free speech because you got to pay for it. So mm -hmm. I don't know about that. Um, he says the other way you could do it is from a UI level. Um, so the UI could be monetized. This kind of goes in hand with what we're talking about with Lens Protocol, where Twitter becomes a... Think of it like an RSS feed, right? If you know RSS feeds is how we do like newsletters and how we do podcasts where there's no UI to it. So user interface, um, mm -hmm. but it is a feed and then people can tap into it. Like Spotify taps into RSS feeds for podcasts. And so does Apple podcast and Substack, et cetera. And you can build out your own user interfaces. And now there's a, a, a cost to either build your own UI or to sell a UI to others kind of thing. And Twitter can take a cut of that. Um, mm -hmm. So it ends up being this sort of decentralized um, protocol underneath and then companies build on top of it. So that's another option to sort of monetize there, um, which is kind of cool, I think. Uh, what else did and you which, say? And which, and which sort of builds upon, you know, the theme of composability that we talk so much right. about with Web3, right? Is you, you'd be turning Twitter into, because it becomes on chain, now it's open and useful in ways that people can build on top of it, sort of connects right. to what we'll talk about with Ethereum later. And whenever I talk about decentralized social media, people talk, people say like where it's not, um, it can't be censored. People are always like, well, but there are things that should be censored. Like if anyone's saying racial comments, like, of course we shouldn't have that. And it's like, yes, I, I agree. Of course, I don't want there to be a platform where you can just like put racial comments or you can degrade whatever. Um, but there are ways of dealing with that. Reddit, for example, has upvoting and downvoting, right? And so you can just put that, but it's on chain. So people actually have to vote. And if it gets enough downvotes, maybe the protocol then hides it, right? Um, I don't know. Mm -hmm. There's things you could do. The other idea here is if it's all on chain, um, it'd be very easy to integrate things like tips and payments and monetization for content creators, Right. Um, very easy because it's already integrated on the blockchain. You can integrate, which is already on Twitter, but NFT profile pictures and avatars. Um, and you can kind of have different ways of doing that. Um, and he puts, you can integrate Dogecoin because Doge. that's obviously what, uh, um, what Elon, Elon loves. Wants. Sure. You can do that if you want, uh, whatever. Uh, <laughs> so then he just goes in to ask questions like, would this be good for Twitter's bottom line? And he goes, I think so. Um, and I think it makes sense to me. Um, but I don't know. And so a lot of takes have actually come out. This was just this morning. A lot of big people like Punk6529 was tweeting about this. Raul Powell was tweeting about this. Um, a lot of people say it's not that hard to do this. Someone just needs to do it. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll see. I mean, Elon is obviously a proponent of, of, I wouldn't say Web3, but he is a proponent of crypto and blockchain. I think he doesn't 
he's probably diving down the rabbit hole of Web3 right now, uh, I'm going to assume. I think he likes decentralization. So could, could Elon do this? Maybe. I would, I would be all for it. Let's, let's hope so, because if he does buy it and he doesn't do this, that also is scary, right? right. So, right. you know, let's, let's, let's hope that this is the path that it goes. Uh, but lots, lots, to come, lots to come on that, that uh, piece of news, because that's going to be a hot topic this week. Elon trying to own energy in the world. He's trying to own communication in the world, and he's trying to own space outside of the world. This guy is <laughs> nuts. He is nuts. nuts. All, All right, right, on uh, to the next one here. Yeah, Sorry. what do we got up Go next here, Kai? No, so you can uh, wanna, take it over. Yeah, I want to talk about the Ethereum merge um, because this is a big deal, and I don't know that a lot of people realize how big of a deal this is. Um, this is probably one of the biggest technological feats uh, in crypto slash the blockchain space ever, uh, other than maybe the initial like inauguration of Bitcoin itself. Um, mm -hmm. But this is a massive deal, and it's a massive deal for a few reasons. Um, one, for the technological feat. I think this is really, really cool. It's a massive deal for um, the largest smart contract platform to um, change up their tokenomics, which is a really big deal. Uh, it's also a big deal for like green energy and things like that. So we'll talk about what that is. So um, this article that we have up here on Twitter is they did the first ever mainnet shadow fork. So basically they used a testnet and they actually did um, a fork of Ethereum, moving it from proof of work to proof of stake. Uh, and it was successful. So this is huge. It shows it's possible. Now they didn't do it on a live one yet. It's on a test net, but it's possible. It's coming. Now, I think yesterday an announcement came out that it's going to be delayed a little bit. Um, it's not really a delay because they never gave a date in the first place. People just assumed it would be June because there's mm -hmm. this other technical thing that's happening in June. So everyone just assumed they were like, it's probably not going to be June. It might be the next month or the next month, whatever. So probably Q3. Either way, it's coming, it's happening, um, and it's going to be great. Now, um, the merge is not about fees. It is not going to decrease fees on Ethereum. That's not what this has to do. It does set up some technological components so that they can do other things to uh, lower fees. But ultimately, Ethereum mainnet is probably never going to have low fees. So we got to get that out of our heads. That's the narrative that just needs to be fixed. Um, this has nothing to do with fees. What this is doing is simply re um, removing miners from securing the network and introducing stakers, okay? Stakers is like Solana, Terra, all these things. They have stakers that, that do it, um, that secure the network. And Bitcoin uses miners. We're, just, we're basically shutting off the miners, getting rid of that, and we're going over to stakers. Why? Few reasons. One, it allows us to significantly decrease the amount of issuance. Issuance is similar to like inflation, right? Um, we got to pay for security and it costs a lot to pay miners. So when you go to stakers, it's a lot cheaper. So this is huge. Um, and we'll talk about why that's huge in a second. Um, but the other thing is we turn off these miners and miners uses a lot of energy, which is obviously not good for the world. Um, and it's not just about the energy, but you have to buy these massive rigs, which they have wear and tear. And after a few years, they, they go to shit and you need to buy new ones. And so like, it's not a very, um, I mean, there's a lot of debate on this. If you talk to Bitcoiners, they think it's the best solution um, for me the future of our internet doesn't really make sense to be running these massive, huge, like miners and rigs that use all this energy around the world. Mm -hmm. it's, it's very odd to me. Um, and I know that they will use renewable energy, but it still just seems odd. Um, so anyway, we turn those off and we go to uh, stakers to, uh, to validate the network instead. Uh, and this is coming in the next, I don't know, I don't want to put times, but let's say three months. Let's move along. Okay, great. So Actually, Jay, any questions on that or any, anything that you've seen a lot of questions on the merge that I should clarify before we do? Uh, well, I think just, just to simplify what you said. So the merge moves everything from proof of work, work to proof of stake. And the, what that allows is a limit on issuance and actually moves the total amount of Ethereum uh, in existence to either see where it is or perhaps even burn, because I think we'll talk about burning in a sec, right? So really what it's doing is it's, it's affecting the currency of Ethereum. Exactly. So, well, it's, so it's affecting the currency, it's affecting the security, which we'll talk about. Yep. 
And then I think the other thing that's interesting is just the fact that it's going now fully green. Like it, it reduces yeah. the carbon emissions by like 99.9%. Yeah. There are a lot of businesses that can't build on or invest in Bitcoin slash Ethereum because it's um, so um, costly in terms of carbon emissions. Mm -hmm. um, this is a big opening for, uh, for businesses to invest, but also to build on Ethereum uh, because right. it's basically has no carbon emissions when it right. moves to proof of stake. But it's not um, going to solve the gas fees problem. Our gas fees on Ethereum will likely still be very high. Correct. And honestly, they'll probably go higher because this is going to create a lot of activity. And right. I think this is going to put um, Ethereum and crypto in general into the media a lot. So um, anyway, um, but yes, that's a good point. So the reason I want to talk about this here, we don't talk about like the tech components of this stuff. We don't really talk about price either. Um, so this is not investment advice and I'm not really going to talk price. What I want to talk about here with this merge and what's happening is that Ethereum is about to become the first and only, uh, at this moment, profitable blockchain. And you might be thinking, how the heck is a blockchain profitable? It's not a business. It is a business. And we're going to dive into that because the tokenomics of Ethereum is something that has been studied and worked on and improved for the last like five, six years. And when you understand, so ETH is the token of Ethereum, the blockchain, the network, right? And when you understand the tokenomics of ETH, I think it really helps you to understand the tokenomics of DAOs and of protocols and of everything happening in Web3 because um, your token is a growth tool. It is a marketing tool for any DAO, for any NFT project, for any uh, anything happening in Web3. We all use tokens now. And if the price of that token goes to zero, that's really bad for your business. It's really bad marketing. Your, your community is not going to be too happy with you if your token goes to zero. But if your token stays stable, or probably if the token goes up, your community is going to be quite happy, right? And as that goes up, probably more people are going to buy in and join your community and be excited about your community. So your token price is actually a very valuable asset for your business and a very valuable um, growth tool. And actually, we have a podcast coming up next week with two um, growth experts in Web3. And they talk a lot about this, of how you can use your token to grow your businesses. And so I really want to explain the ETH tokenomics because one, it's probably the most well thought out, the most like it's been worked on the longest. And it's probably going to be, once this merge happens, the most successful um, or one of the most successful. And it just helps because there's so many areas with it. It'll help you understand all the other tokens in this space. Um, so that's what I want to dive into here. So to start this. Before what I want... we dive in, just yep. two quick questions for the simplicity's sake of this. Kai, just yes, sir. give a quick definition of tokenomics. I think a lot of people hear that word, throw it around. What does tokenomics yeah. mean? So this is your economics of your token. And what this means is tokens can do a lot of things in Web3. Um, right. And so this sort of breaks down all of those together. So you think of like a token as an economy, right? So kind of like you could think of the US dollar, what are the things that make the US dollar have value? Well, right. um, you know, you have the military that backs the US, you have the petrodollar. So the US dollar is intertwined with a lot of different countries around the world to pay for gas and to exchange and do trade. So those are all economics of the US dollar. This right. is also true in, in tokens in Web3 with utility and its issuance and all these different things. So we'll dive right. into that a little and, bit. And tokenomics is not just important to investors, because I think a lot of people think about it in that way. It's important to any business owner, any entrepreneur, any creator, any artist that wants to use Web3, because exactly. tokenomics is not just the prices that we see of Bitcoin and of Ethereum, tokenomics also would be considered if you were to launch an NFT, because Correct. that's another form that's just a non-fungible token, right? And so I think that this has these learnings in this discussion has value to any business owner, anybody that is creating something in Web3, because as you said, the structure and the strategy with which you consider your token is what gives it value which in turn is what makes your community more bought in and gives right. them more reason to participate. Yes. And so tokenomics covers like the amount of tokens you have, the distribution right. of its tokens, yeah. um, the, but also like the utility of the token, the governance yeah. of the token, like all these different things are all what make the value of a token or the usefulness of a, of a token. And that's kind of what we're going to dive into. Um, 
Okay, so let's let's start with this. I want to do kind of a mental model here. I want everyone to think of blockchains as a business because they actually are a business. And what is the business that blockchains are in? Well, they are in the business of selling block space. And honestly, I think block space is probably going to be the most valuable product of the 2020s. Um, we're already seeing it if you look at some of the numbers here on the screen. Um, but so blockchains sell block space, the same as Apple sells iPhones, right? Facebook sells ads, blockchains sell block space. Now the difference here is that there is not a company for this business. It is a protocol, but it does have expenses and it has revenues, right? And this is extremely important because this is the tokenomics of, of this network. Um, and what happens when a, a business has expenses that are too high versus its, its, um, its revenues? Well, eventually it goes bankrupt, right? Now, I guess you can get debt and you can like, it can last longer for a little bit, but eventually it will go bankrupt. And this is true of, of blockchains as well. This is true of DAOs. This is true of all of these different protocols. So it's very, very important. And so, okay, we know that blockchains sell block space, okay? And um, I think the, the easiest way to think of this is you have the fees of a blockchain, which you could think of as, let's say, revenues, right? So this is people paying Ethereum to use its network, paying Bitcoin to use its network. And then you have, or Solana or whatever, right? Now it's not the best rep representation of, of revenue. So I'll, I'll get into that in just a second, but let's think of that as, re as revenue for now. Then you have um, your expenses. Well, what are the expenses of a protocol? There's no employees, there's nothing there. What are those expenses? Well, blockchains, they sell block space and that block space needs to actually exist and be secure, right? If that, if that network goes down, then it can't really sell any block space. So its expenses are paying for security, right? That's the expenses. You can see, we actually have, um, for those that are, are listening, we have up on the screen here, uh, a bunch of different pages that um, David Michal um, has, has created. We had him on our podcast about a month ago, where it looks at all the different um, expenses and revenues of all these different protocols. Um, and so we're gonna kind of talk and dive into that a little bit. So let's go to the um, expenses one first. So. When you think of expenses for a blockchain, that's in its terms, its issuance. So it's creating new tokens on a monthly daily, it's actually on a daily basis um, in, in paying its, its um, validators. So the people that are securing the network, okay? So in Bitcoins, um, uh, the way that Bitcoin works is it would pay its miners. Ethereum right now, it's paying miners. It's about to switch to paying its validators through its stakers. Um, Solana, Polkadot, Avalanche, they all do this. All of the rest of these here are um, through stakers. And so um, that's where it pays its, um, its expenses from. Now, right now, Ethereum's issuance rate, so the amount that it's, it, that it's inflating its supply is at 4.16% compared to Bitcoin, which is 1.71. 4.16 is pretty high. The US right now is 8.5, I think it was announced earlier this week. Yeah, you can also think of blockchains almost as nation states, right? Where you have taxes and you have um, you have revenues, your GDP. Mm -hmm. You can think of it that way as well. But let's let's stick with the business model here. Then, if you go down the list here, you can see Solana's at six point nine nine percent, so seven percent. Polkadot at seven point nine two, Avalanche at five point seven seven. So, in terms of like number value, Ethereum is the highest. Its daily issuance is forty two million dollars a day. It's mm -hmm. creating an ETH to validate and secure the network. Bitcoin is 37 million, Solana is 10 million, Avalanche is 5 million, and the list goes on and on. Some of these things are super high, but, um, but that's okay. So when the merge happens, what actually happens here is the issuance rate of Ethereum, because it goes from proof of work to proof of stake, is gonna be decreased by 90%. So I mm. think its issuance rate goes to 0.45%, somewhere around there. Super, super, super low. So it's going to be somewhere around, I don't know what 90% would be there, but let's say, I don't know, $10 million. Uh, even even less, probably like, even probably, lower. probably 5 million, like even right. slightly so, less, four, four, so, 4 million, 4 or 5 million. Right. Okay. So let's say around 5 million. I think it goes from right now, it's, it's issuing 12 thousand new ETH a day and it goes down to like 1200 or 1500 ETH in ETH mm -hmm. terms because obviously if the price of ETH goes up then that dollar terms issuance will change as well. So it significantly reduces the the fees to verify and secure the blockchain. So its expenses are being cut by 90%. 
Now let's go over to the rev to the um, to the other side. To the left, yeah. So this is crypto fees. So right now, ETH is is earning, let's say, or or, or is generating sixteen million dollars in fees um, per day. So that's not profitable, right? Right now, I think mm -hmm. it's forty. What do we say? Forty, whatever. Forty-two. 000, 40, yeah. Forty-two million, million. In, in expenses, exactly. And its revenue is sixteen million. Okay, so it's not profitable. If we look at all the other blockchains, they're even worse. Okay, Binance mm -hmm. Smart Chain is making one point five million. And it's expenses, it might not even be on this one. It's not even on here. It's not on here. Okay, so let's go, let's look at Bitcoin, for example. Bitcoin is um, 36 million in expenses and it makes 413,000. So it is a very unprofitable blockchain. Solana earns $67,000 a day and it spends to secure its network 10 million. So the profitability of these blockchains are awful to say the least. Um, and now these things will improve, hopefully, as we're seeing Ethereum is improving and I'm sure others will as well. Um, but the profitability of these things are not that good. And if we think about this long-term, how is Solana gonna, gonna like um, continue to do that? How can it continue to go at and operate at a, I don't even know what deficit that is, like almost, it's basically $10 million, $10 million. deficit daily. <laughs> it's insane, right? Um, so how can it continue to do that? Eventually, the token price goes down because it's just issuing so much, just like we're seeing in the fiat world. So how can these blockchains figure out a way to make this profitable? Well, let's go to the next um, thing here. So this is something that Ethereum did is they initiated um, an ETH burn. And basically what this is, is it takes some of those fees, right? So we said its fees were at, uh, what was it, 16 million. And it burns them. And so in Ethereum's case, I think it's burning something like 80% of its fees. I don't know what it is. So this one, actually this one is, we can see total, that's total. Can we see burn in the day? Yeah, Scroll no. down. I think this chart here is, if you switch that to daily, yeah, it's burning 10,000 10, ETH per day. It's something like 80% of all of that is being burned. And when we say burn, what that's doing is it's actually burning that ETH and getting rid of it. You can think of this the same as like a buyback for a, a company. So Tesla does this, right? Like they want to buy back their company and put less on the open market. This is very bullish and a good thing for a company because they want to own more. That's what ETH is essentially doing. They're lowering the amount of ETH that's available on the market. And this is happening every day. It's burning about 80%. And so if we can see that it's burning, I think it's, let's say it's, I don't know, $10 million worth of ETH per day, and eventually their issuance is going to go down to, let's say, $5 million, then they're profitable by $5 million per day. And what that actually means is that it becomes a deflationary asset, right? So it's deflationary, so there's less ETH on the, every single day, um, and that becomes a profitable and a, um, what's the word that I'm looking for? where it, it can last long-term, right? It's a- Sustainable. Uh, sustainable, exactly. A sustainable business model, right? Which is what we want in the real world with all businesses. And so Ethereum is about to do that with its merge. And I think this is just really, really key thing to understand is that these blockchains are businesses and they need to sustain their business models in order for the price to sustain in order for people to continue to want to use it, right? And continue to want to hold it and find utility around it. So the other part here, what's the next one here? Oh, this is just an interesting. So if you go to ultrasound.money, um, which is a meme of, of ETH that it's a ultrasound money, um, but this is another way you can look at the burn. And this is actually interesting. You can see the burn leaderboard. So you can see what protocols on Ethereum are burning the most ETH. And so you can see OpenSea is the biggest one, then Uniswap, uh, et cetera. Um, so just an interesting way to see like where the activity is coming from on the protocol and um, and also, actually, when we think of business model of Ethereum, I know a lot of people are like, well, you know, this Ethereum is not sustainable because the, the gas fees are too high. So I can never do anything on it, right, as a, as a human. But if we look here, the biggest burners of Ethereum are not people. It is actually protocols, right? The, it is MetaMask and OpenSea and Uniswap and Tether and yeah, that's basically it. A bunch of these different protocols. So it's not humans, right? And these protocols don't care about the cost. They're good. They have their own revenues. And so they're the ones doing it. And actually, if you scan to the next one, um, 
we have another one. This is layer two. So these are other blockchains that are actually just connecting into Ethereum and paying, and instead of them paying for security, they're just using Ethereum security, right? Because we already know it's paying so much for it. And so these blockchains are now paying Ethereum to secure its own blockchain. And so this is another customer of Ethereum. So now Ethereum has a few customers, right? If we think of it again as a business model, you have protocols that are built on Ethereum, like applications, which are paying for Ethereum security. You have other blockchains, which are paying for Ethereum security. And then you have humans, right? Whales are paying for Ethereum, Ethereum security. So that's where the revenue comes from and this burn comes from. And that's not going anywhere. And if you scroll down, it actually, this, this chart that we're looking at shows all of the layer two. So all the blockchains plug into Ethereum, they are spending over, let's see, somewhere around, uh, yesterday was 120,000, but it goes up to 200 to $300,000 a day just to Ethereum, just to secure their own networks. So think of these customers that they have. They have the sustainable business model of protocols that are just paying to use that network. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we have a business that sells blocks we have a bunch of different customers, right? These customers are actually robots that are, don't care about the price. <laughs> They're just going to continue to do it. And then we have utility of the ETH token itself. And the way you think of that is like utility in DeFi, right? You have a bunch of people who buy ETH and they use it as collateral so they can get out a loan and they can go do other things and buy real world assets or whatever they want to do. Or you have people buying ETH to stake it to secure the network and they earn a percent on it. And so now you have all of this ETH that's getting stuck inside of smart contracts that can't be sold. And again, this is another good thing for the token because a lot of selling pressure equals price goes down, right? A lot of buying pressure or holding pressure means price stays the same or goes up. That is all good for business. And so just as we look at this Ethereum network, as the merge comes, it's going to make Ethereum a profitable blockchain. Um, and, and ultimately it's going to make ETH this sort of profitable equity. You want to think it kind of like Amazon stock or Apple stock. Like when Apple is making profit, Apple stock does well, of course, right? People want to buy into that. Well, that's what's happening here with ETH. And so uh, Jay, I'm going to let you ask any questions you want, but does this give a representation of tokenomics here? And was this helpful? Yeah, I think definitely. Uh, I think let's, let's zoom out for a second. Um, so other than uh, being a um, a great explanation for ETH and uh, not investment advice, but a uh, certainly listeners are probably ears are perking up of oh my gosh I should go buy some ETH again not investment advice, um, <laughs> but yeah why why does this matter to um, to to a business owner uh, to a creator. Right. So here's, here's why this matters. So I'm going to give another example. So when Axie Infinity, which is probably the most popular Web3 game, um, mm -hmm. when Axie Infinity first launched and became super popular, there's all these people using it. Um, I bought in and bought some of the, the game assets, the in-game assets, mm -hmm. right? Again, Axie is a business, right? And I bought some of the characters so that you could play the game. And I rented them out to, um, to other people so they could play for me and we split the profits. Now, tokenomics is massive here because we were earning this token called, well, we are earning this token called Smooth Love Potion. <clears throat> but in Axie's instance, they were issuing a ton of this new SLP. Every time you played and you won in the game, you would mm -hmm. get new tokens and they would actually mint new tokens, the same as ETH and Bitcoin and them are minting new tokens to secure their network. But what happens is they didn't have a burn. Well, they have a burn, but it wasn't a good enough burn that it was profitable. So they were actually mm -hmm. minting more Smooth Love Potions than they were burning. And so it was inflation. So the same as the US dollar, this token just went down and down and down and down and down. And over the last year, it's essentially gone to zero. It's, it still has some value, but it's essentially gone to zero. And so they have been working tirelessly to find new ways to create utility for that smooth love potion token so that more people want to hold it and use it and even burn it because they need to make it profitable. And so again, you got to look at, if you're looking at creating a DAO, or you're looking at creating a game, which I mean, a lot of people are doing, or I even saw one, I think it's called Step In. And this is a, a, mm -hmm. a fitness We talked about where, this last week. Right, so where you, you connect to it and when you walk and you move, you earn tokens, right? Mm -hmm. And again, 
if that token goes to zero, no one's going to use your app anymore, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all cool about creating these new tokens and everyone is creating tokens and basically printing money out of thin air. But how are you making sure that that evens out and it becomes a profitable token, yeah. right? So that it doesn't go to zero. Because if you look at Axie Infinity right now, I should have brought up this chart. When their token was going up, the amount of new people coming into that game was insane. It was one of the fastest mm -hmm. growing games, fastest growing things in Web3 by far. Now, if you look, their token has gone basically to nothing over the last six to nine months. Their user base has been cut in, I don't know, at least half. It's basically just been going down as the token goes down. So again, this is a marketing tool. This is a big, important piece for anyone who has a Web3 business. And not everyone is going to have a token that inflates. Maybe you just have a limited supply. But again, what's the utility for that token? If everyone's selling it, that token goes down in price, it's no longer useful. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that that Axie example is just a really, um, a really good one to sort of see how this plays out into actual Web3 games and Web3 other businesses that are happening. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the, um, just to like dumb this down even further, because I do think that a lot of, I mean, myself included, I'm not a tokenomics expert. Uh, I get lost in, you know, thinking about you know, how, how, how much of a token should you put into existence and how should you do issuance? Um, so I think it's almost easier to think about it in NFT terms sometimes to me, because it's smaller, much smaller numbers. Um, and so the way I like to think about this is if you're going to release an NFT, you need to think about, first of all, how many of that NFT you're going to release. And I think we, we all see, oh, 10,000. Everyone's got these collections of 10,000 or 7,777. 7, 7, but the key is these numbers aren't random. What you need to think about is how many people in your community do you have that actually value the token, the NFT that you're going to create so that you can ensure that you have enough of a community that's going to buy it. So maybe in the beginning, start with 100 NFTs instead of 10,000 NFTs, if that's the size of your community. And then, so you think about first is, okay, how many community members that I have that are going to engage? And then second is what's the utility in order to keep my community members involved so they're not just, you know, pump and dump, right? Right. Scarcity and utility. Those yes. are kind of the two big categories are, of yeah. let's call it tokenomics or whatever, but scarcity matters. Yes. And utility matters. Those are the two big things to think about. Um, and by the way, this is not one, it was not investment advice for ETH by any means. Um, this is not to say that all the other blockchains that I mentioned that are really not profitable. This is not to say that um, they won't do this either. I mean, ETH is just getting to this now and it's six, mm -hmm. seven years into existence. So like Solana, Terra, all these things, which are awesome and do great things, they could also do this. And they honestly, they probably will. If they don't do this, actually, just like I said with Axie, uh, they're fucked, right? So they're mm -hmm. going to have to do this. So they all will do this. They all will, will change in some way. And whether that's a burn or something else, we'll see. Um, but uh, let's, let's skip this um, layer two one here, actually, uh, Jay, and, and let's move on. All right, let's move on to Duquan because Duquan gives us news every week. Uh, what <laughs> does, what did Duquan do? What did the master of stablecoin do this week? <laughs> the master of ego. What did he do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, the master of ego. I like that. Yeah, if you guys are not following this, like follow it. One because like it's just it's very new of what's happening here in crypto. You know, Terra Duquan, by the way, or Doquan, I think it is is the founder of, of Terra Luna. They're buying up all this Bitcoin. I think they're at, I don't even know what it is now, a couple billion worth of Bitcoin they have. Mm -hmm. um, but they they actually bought, uh, this is kind of random, but I, I see what they're doing here, but they bought $100 million worth of AVAX, which is the Avalanche token, another layer one. You could think of them almost as a competitor to Terra, but not really, because Terra is trying to get their, their stable coin on, on a bunch of different blockchains. But what's interesting in the way they did this, they didn't actually buy the $100 million in AVAX. They, they swapped Luna tokens for AVAX tokens. And so this is another form of utility for your token. This actually plays in with tokenomics here. It's a marketing tool. This was more marketing more than like, they weren't buying or getting this 100 million of AVAX to like backstop the, the peg of UST, the stable coin, like they are with Bitcoin. AVAX is way more, like AVAX is way more um, uh, unstable than, than Bitcoin. So like, this isn't for that. But it's a great marketing tool because what they did is 
by them owning and holding a hundred million dollars of AVAX, that's bullish and, and great for the AVAX community. The Avalanche community probably loves this. So now they're going to support Terra even more, right? They're probably now going to be more likely to hold UST because, well, Terra holds their token, their governance, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so it's a great sort of like partnership. Like, let's say, I don't know, Apple ever partnered with, I don't know, Facebook or something. Mm-hmm. They could exchange <laughs> stock, right? I mean, no, they would never do that, but they would exchange yeah. stock. Now, it's hard to do in the traditional world, very easy to do in the Web3 world. And I think this is where DAOs are going to do this a lot. And even NFT projects, right? Mm-hmm. You want to partner with another DAO or another NFT project, you share some of your assets. And now you both mm-hmm. have some... Um, some stake in the game, right? Um, and I, so I think that's that's really interesting. Um, again, I have no idea if this whole Luna experiment and what Doquan's doing is going to work out, um, but just doing some really cool things that Web three enables, right? Yeah, um, and, with and I think a lot of cross token stuff. And, and I think there's some some yeah some interesting points here. Uh, is one you mentioned um, trying to do this with a public company would be would take six months, due diligence, lawyers, the burden would be huge to do a, a stock swap like this, right? Um, so it's much quicker in Web3 and then on the blockchain, you can move fast, you can make make moves like this. But the other big thing is, like you said, it it allows sort of this Web3 this web mantra, this Web3 philosophy of wag me, right? We always talk about like, we're all gonna make it, we're in this together and this is what we're seeing is we're seeing in web three, we're seeing collaboration, I think more than because of this underlying philosophy, private companies or even public companies, they have this mantra of like, own your stuff, don't share it, don't tell anybody else what you're doing, right? Like make us the most profit. Whereas in web three, we're seeing these, these things happen, which are much more about collaboration, much more about working together, partnership. You know, it's, it, it's, it's a bit of a change in, in a system of, of a way of thinking that we've had for a long time. That's a great point. It's connecting the communities, right? It's yeah. connecting the communities. Um, and then other news on, on, on uh, it's not really news, but um, so Bridge, um, the Terra Bridge uh, now supports Avalanche, Solana. Oh, wow. Solana too. I, did, I thought it was only EVM. Osmosis, Phantom, Moonbeam. And, and what Do Kwan says, this is the easiest way to move funds in crypto. And so again, this, this moves Terra onto a bunch of different blockchains, which is huge, a good marketing play again. Um, but what's really cool about this is the utility of the, the, mm. the, the protocol here that they just made is you can... So basically Terra is now connected into everything. Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, Harmony, Solana, blah, blah, blah. Listen, there's, I don't even know. There's 20 of them at least. Um, and, and basically what you can do now is you can move and swap your, your UST from one blockchain to another. So before this, and there are bridges that do this already, um, and some of them are good, some of them not so good. The main way to move your money from one blockchain to another is like go through a centralized exchange like Coinbase or Binance or Crypto.com. Terra now kind of allows you to do that through a stable coin of UST and move along from bridge to bridge, um, which is super useful. Now, one thing to say, and as we talked about, I think it was a couple of weeks ago, I wasn't on this one, but we saw that $600 million um, bridge hack from the Ronin mm-hmm. chain, which is the chain to Axie. Bridges are not secure. Okay. Mm-hmm. They are not secure. No bridge is secure right now. No bridge that is between other blockchains is secure bridges because they don't use cryptography. They have to use some sort of trusted or multi-sig. Um, we talked a little bit about this on unlock protocol interview last week, or I mean, mm-hmm. a couple of days ago. Um, but there is some sort of centralization and trust in bridges. So be careful. And same with this one. This one is also the same thing. It is not a decentralized bridge when you're connecting from another blockchain. Um, it is, there is risk, there is risk of smart contract, there is risk of multi-sig, et cetera. Um, so be careful, but it's being worked on. It's an experiment and, and like, we're hoping that they can find a way to do this cryptographically. Vitalik says not possible. Um, bridges though, from a layer one to a layer two that share the same security. So if you think ETH to Ethereum, mainnet to Arbitrum or, or Optimism, um, those are cryptographic bridges, which are secure. Um, so little risk, little to no risk there. These ones where you're going from different layer ones, risk. Um, but hopefully we can experiment enough and, and maybe Do Kwan will be the guy that figures it out. I don't know. 
eventually we can make these secure. Um, but cool to have a way to do it in a non-custodial fashion. If you ever need to bridge from different blockchains. So last week we had Bitcoin Con. We talked uh, we talked a little bit about it a, a few weeks ago. Um, not a ton of hype around this unless you're a, a Bitcoin maximalist. Uh, but some some exciting news came out of it. What what came out of the Bitcoin Con, Kyle? Yeah, I, I think last week I, I under roll up I kind of tripped the conference a little bit. Um, I mean, as I said last week as well, I'm a fan of Bitcoin and everything that's going on there. It's just not a lot going on there outside of store value, which is great. Store value is super important. Uh, but after I said that, I looked on Twitter, literally basically after we got off our podcast, and there was a bunch of announcements from the conference that are really good for the industry as a whole. Um, adoption to Bitcoin means adoption to Web3. Um, mm -hmm. Although Bitcoin, some people say it's not Web3, just people getting into crypto, eventually they go down the rabbit hole and they get into NFTs and they get into DAOs and everything that's going on. So um, we have a few different things. Madeira, I don't know what that is. To adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Is that a country? I think it's a country. I think it's a country. Yeah. I actually don't, I've never heard have, of it. So we have another country that's going to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Shopify integrates the Lightning Network, which I did say last week. I was excited about the Lightning Network. Mm -hmm. So now you can buy anything on Shopify through with Bitcoin using the Lightning Network. So there's basically no fees. Mexico, this one's big if this actually happens, but Mexico to propose Bitcoin as legal tender. If that happens, oh my God, Mexico is a massive country, big GDP. Um, that would be insane. Uh, Mexicans billionaire. Um, so one of their most wealthy people in Mexico who has consistently said he's a big fan of Bitcoin now has 60% of his wealth in Bitcoin. Um, I don't know how true that actually is, but I guess he announced <laughs> that at the conference. That's um, but that's insane. That's the type um, of stuff I expect Robin, to come out of the Bitcoin conference. <laughs> Just right, a bunch yeah, of right, people right. <laughs> showing their wealth in Bitcoin. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, right. That's exactly it. Robinhood integrates Lightning Network. So one of the most popular, um, what do you call that? Like financial exchanges for stocks and things. Yeah. They integrate Lightning Network. I don't really know what that means. Uh, maybe I guess you can move your Bitcoin onto Robinhood to then go buy stocks. That's what I think it's got to mean, yeah. Okay. Uh, and then Roatan, which is a, it's not technically, I mean, I, I don't know if it's technically its own country or not, but it's a part of Honduras, but it's kind of its own mm -hmm. thing. Uh, but it adopts Bitcoin as legal tender. And actually a friend of mine is there right now. She's been living there because she does um, diving. She was saying a bunch of the cafes and, and local places have all been um, promoting that you can buy things and use, um, and you can use Bitcoin there. Um, so that's great for adoption. Super cool. Um, so lots of things happening in terms of adoption, which is, which is <laughs> what we want. That's what we need. So good job, Bitcoin. Okay, let's switch gears to the metaverse. Uh, so much happening in the metaverse uh, and it's just the start as well. Uh, but let's just, let's go through some of the news that came out in the last week, Kyle, around different brands working on the metaverse. Yeah, this is where the mayhem comes from. A little bit of Elon, a little bit of all this <laughs> metaverse stuff. Um, so obviously the metaverse is, is where this is all going, uh, we believe anyway, and it's a big deal. And I mean, every, I think every week we talk about some one that's in metaverse is going to be a big deal or it's going to be worth mm -hmm. this much or they're going to build a metaverse. So this week, I think the one I'm most excited about so far that I've seen is um, Lego and Epic Games um, announced that they're going to build a metaverse. That's going to be a kick-ass metaverse. I don't care what everyone says, that's cool as hell. <laughs> and Epic Games is a massive um, uh, gaming company. I think the biggest in the world. Uh, one know. of the biggest, one of the biggest in the world, the one that I feel like you and I probably know because Epic Games owns EA Sports. So uh, that's yeah, the one exactly. that we grew up with. <laughs> I mean, I guess, look here, they also own uh, Fortnite, uh, mm -hmm. which is the biggest game in the world. Um, and mm -hmm. so Fortnite game developer um, raises $2 billion from Sony, Kirk B to build a metaverse, $2 billion. So the amount of money that's going into building up this stuff is insane. I think we don't even have this in here, but Meta, you know, obviously Facebook, they're spending, I think, 10 billion a year. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's crazy. And then we have um, what are the other ones. I think it was South Korea, like the government said that they're going to spend billions on metaverse as well. I don't know. It's crazy. Anyway, let's keep going. Okay. And then Meta, uh, Facebook, uh, they oh, made yeah. a big announcement around their metaverse. 
uh, which caught a lot of flack on Twitter. Uh, so we'll save you the time of watching. There's a 20 minute video that they released uh, that you can watch if you're a, a Facebook uh, investor. Um, but uh, basically here's the, uh, the, sh the quick and dirty of it. Um, they're calling their metaverse Horizon Worlds uh, and you will be able to sell and buy virtual items yep. and land in it. Uh, but the reason that crypto went crazy is because they are taking 47.5% of sales on virtual items. Uh, in comparison, uh, Apple takes 30%, which is often seen as high. Uh, oh, that is yeah. referred to as a high take rate. OpenSea, in comparison, takes 2.5%. You know, I think there's this, this mental model that a lot of people talked about around the shift from web two to web three and that web two had too high of a take rate because the because of the really the the business model did not allow these businesses to be profitable so they had to have a high take rate or they had to do advertising right one of those right. two and that web three could have this lower take rate and this is why we all don't want meta to create the metaverse uh because they're just gonna i mean I guess Facebook and Instagram right now take 100%. So maybe, <laughs> maybe this do. is actually a deal in comparison to what you're getting with them right now. Um, but to play devil's advocate, this is the head start that Meta has is um, they, they, they're, they announced a fund, like a creator's fund. So they have $10 million that they're going to give away to creators to build in their metaverse and use their platform on Horizon Worlds. Uh, and then also don't forget that Facebook owns Oculus and Oculus is one of the largest uh, virtual reality heart pieces of hardware. And they have currently 2.5 million daily active users on Oculus. So that really gives them a head start. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think one of the beautiful things of Web3 that we talk about is the, the sort of um, seamless interoperability. And so if you're not treated well in an application, you can move to another one and bring what you own with you. You can't do this in Web2, right? If I have a bunch of followers on Twitter and I don't like Twitter anymore because Elon's buying it, and I don't like Elon, I can't just port all my followers over to Instagram mm -hmm. and all my content over to Instagram and my profile over to Instagram. Web3 allows you to do that, right? And so I guess I don't know if this is going to be Web3 at all. It so sounds like you're going to have buy and selling things. I don't know if that's going to be through NFTs or not. Um, I've heard that they are. Um, and so if people don't like it, they're going to be able to just move elsewhere. Um, it, it boggles my mind that they're doing this because like, you've got to think that Mark Zuckerberg knows that. He's mm -hmm. obviously a very smart person and I'm sure his board is as well. Um, so like they got to understand that they can't compete, but I, I think what their, their bet is, is like, if you've ever used the metaverses in the crypto world that are interoperable, they, they remind you of like the Sims from like the mm -hmm. 1990s, right? They're not great. Um, other than the fact that they are interoperable. And so he's putting $10 billion or they are putting $10 billion a year into meta into building out this metaverse. So like, he's probably putting the bet on that, like the mainstream who haven't used NFTs and haven't used crypto don't really care that much. They just want a cool experience. And mm -hmm. I think he thinks he can build a metaverse that's just so user-friendly and has so much value for, I don't know where they're going to work, do all these things that like he's going to win. Um, and honestly, he probably will in the beginning, <laughs> right? $10 billion. I don't know what Decentraland's paying a, a year to build out what they're building, but it's not $10 not billion. $10 billion. <laughs> so yeah, I think eventually people leave when they realize that they can like move around in the metaverse and earn money. They won't be able to do that in his and eventually they will move and eventually mm -hmm. that will change. But I don't know. We'll see what happens. All right. This is a take here uh, by myself, yours truly. Um, and uh, <laughs> it was on the metaverse. And so it kind of fit with what we're talking about. But what I said is, I don't think that land in the metaverse is going to hold any value. Uh, mm -hmm. My assumption is most new good metaverse platforms that come out um, go without selling land at all. I think it's a skeuomorphic way of creating a new world. Um, and the reason why land has been sold, especially in like Decentraland Sandbox, et cetera, is because what people think is that if you're beside, I don't know, a main part of the metaverse, like you're beside Snoop Dogg's 
you know, party bar or whatever he has inside the metaverse, then that's good for branding. Just like, you know, it is in the real world. Um, if you're beside, I don't know, a high traffic thing, then that land is worth more. Um, the thing is like, I don't think we're going to be walking around metaverses all that much. Like no mm. one likes transporting, like transportation in the real world. We all hate having to walk somewhere. We, if we could teleport, we would do it. Well, you can teleport in the metaverse. So <laughs> we're going to teleport. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. so like, I just, I just don't see it other than games. I think maybe like gaming, it's popular to walk around and go into different things to buy your swords and to do different things. So like, maybe it makes sense there, but I just, there's no way I'm going to spend time walking from one place to another when I can just type in a URL, right? Like you think of how the internet works now, right? Mm -hmm. Which is pretty good. I can just go to Google or I can just type in something and it takes me to the page I need. I don't think the metaverse is going to be much different from that. Um, I just, yeah, I don't see me walking around a metaverse. I'm not going to waste my time. We'll see. <laughs> Any thoughts on that, Jay? Uh, I mean, I think that like you, you make a good point around it's a skeuomorphic way of thinking and skeuomorphic as a term basically means that you build based upon the way old things are built, right? And so, uh, yeah, I think that what we need to do is we need to get out of our, our frame of mind of like, oh, the metaverse is just a, a world that's going to look exactly like our planet, but is in the digital world, but it's not. It's going to be something completely different. And the biggest innovations and the people that succeed are the ones that think differently. Right. And also because it's seamless, you can go from metaverse to metaverse so easily. So it actually doesn't even, it might not even matter what metaverse you're in. Now, maybe some metaverse have better experiences and it's more user-friendly, et cetera. So like, okay, I get that. Um, but like, I don't know that it, one, there's endless amounts of land we can create. There's endless amounts of metaverse. There's gonna be so many, and it's gonna be easy to go from one to the other. If there was a certain amount of land in Facebook only, like for a certain amount of whatever you want to call it in Facebook, I get it. You can't leave that. So if there's a lot of people in there, that's very, very valuable, right? It's why like coastal land um, is very valuable. There's a lot of people that want it. There's, there's a scarce amount of it. There's, yeah. there's an unlimited amount of land in the metaverse. Um, so I just, I just don't see it. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. Um, just to uh, further make the the point if we haven't already and if you're not hearing enough that the metaverse is coming and happening and that every business should be thinking about it um kpmg last week came out with a, a a big report on the metaverse they did some customer surveys they wrote a big report uh, and kpmg is one of the largest consulting firms in the world uh and they're saying hey if you don't have a metaverse strategy now you better, you better get on top of it. Uh, and it's just a couple stats to share that came out of this study. I mean, it's like a hundred page report. You can go read it yourself. Uh, but um, one stat was really interesting was they estimate that 70% of businesses will have presence in the metaverse within the next five years. So that's how fast this is moving. Uh, and then I just wanted to call out a quote from one of their studies uh, that I really like. This is by um, a researcher from Australia's University of Technical uh, technology in Sydney. And she says, avatars will allow people to represent themselves beyond the limitations of status. There's the opportunity to alleviate people's identity beyond their wardrobe or how much money they have in their bank account. There's more freedom to express themselves beyond gender representation and social conventions. So we have this opportunity to be whoever we want to be, which is really attractive, obviously, to a lot of people who struggle with their social status, with the amount of money they have in their bank account. Uh, and you can see really the attraction to, to being in a digital world. It, it allows us to be some, something else. And I hope that, I mean that in a positive way, obviously not a negative way. Right, absolutely. I mean, we already kind of see this with like profile pictures on Twitter, the amount, like I, probably 75% of people who uh, I see on Twitter have not themselves as their profile mm -hmm. picture. They represent themselves as something else. And I know, especially in the younger generation, that's even more popular. Um, and so absolutely, I can see when you're walking around the metaverse, which you just said we probably won't do. Uh, but if you are, whether that's in a game or something else, you'd use an avatar, right? And you can decorate that avatar with clothes, just like you 
yourself. You can put hats and you can buy shoes and whatever, and um, you'll be able to express yourself in whatever ways you want. And probably in ways that we're not even thinking of, because again, what we're doing is thinking skeuomorphic, right? Exactly. It'll probably be something completely different. Yeah, exactly. Uh, next up, if you haven't seen it already, uh, Bored Ape uh, is launching a three-part film. Um, wow, like huge. I think this is Coinbase is the one that's funding this, if I'm correct, or they're the ones behind this. So Coinbase is going to create an interactive three-part film uh, with Board Ape Yacht Club and the ApeCoin community. Uh, what's what's going on here? It's called the DGen Trilogy is the current brand name that they're going under, which uh, is hilarious and very Web3 of them. Kai, what's going yeah, on Yeah, I here? think, you know, it's, it's funny if there's... There's a couple uh, groups that we continue to talk about every single mm -hmm. week in our rollups. It's, it's like Doquan and Terra Luna, uh, and then it's uh, and then it's Board Eight Yacht Club, right? Mm -hmm. Just every week they're doing something. So yeah, Coinbase invested, and um, Coinbase Ape Coin, which is now that came out, um, and Board Eight Yacht Club have all teamed up, and they're creating a three-part film um, featuring the Board Eight Yacht Club communities. And so the first film is all about Board Eight Yacht Club. Um, they actually announced, I don't know if it's one of the tweets that I have up here, but the second film is going to be about the Mutant Ape Yacht Club, I believe. Uh, and then yeah, here it is. So Board Ape Yacht Club says, we're stoked that Coinbase is making a film series featuring the Board Ape Yacht Club community. Board Ape NFT holders submit your ape for ca for casting. So the, the NFT apes are going to be the like characters in this movie. Mm -hmm. And this is Mutants, don't worry. This is the first film in a trilogy. Um, and you'll be getting your own casting call for part two. Um, so really, really cool. They're involving their community. They're involving the NFTs. And then go to the third one here. This is what I think is really cool here. And again, Web3 is, is just really cool. So um, this Josh Ong uh, tweeted out. He said, interesting solution by Coinbase for their board ape movies. Licensing agreements will be minted as NFTs that will transfer transfer with the ape to any future purchasers. So what he means here is those that get selected to be a part of the movie, if their ape shows um, in the movie, they're going to get paid just like an actor would get paid. But this is no one, they don't actually have to act. Maybe they'll do their, they'll be the voice. I don't know, like the owner could be the voice. I have no idea how that's going to work. Um, but, uh, but so the, the owners of those NFTs will get paid for um, being a part of the, the movie. Now you can sell your board at Yacht Club. And so then how does that work? And so Coinbase's solution was, well, let's NFT the rights to this. And let's attach it to the Board at Yacht Club NFT. And so when you sell your NFT and someone buys it, those rights move along with it. Um, and so now all of a sudden the new owner gets paid. So super, super cool. And just like, obviously this is where this world's going to go with movies and everything else. Um, super cool. Well done, Coinbase. Well done, Board Ape Yacht Club again. Jeez. Mm -hmm. And ApeCoin. Right, utility. This is they're they're going to be probably owners of this movie. Um, helps the token. Everything's coming together. Incredible, incredible. Yeah, and I think a, a utility, but also smart contracts. Like we don't we don't always talk enough about the underlying importance of smart contracts in here and the power of smart contracts. Right. And really, that's what Coinbase is doing here is they're using smart contracts to control ownership of the of of your role in the movie or of your position in the movie and that can transfer between by between owners of the nft uh it's amazing how how seamless smart contracts allow this all to work and trustless the yeah. new owners that are going to buy that board at yacht club that's featured in whatever movie they don't have <clears> to <throat> think they don't have to go and review some like right. agreement that was made that was signed by someone else and then go yeah. talk to coinbase like hey i'm gonna buy this thing like are you, can we sign a contract to make sure I get these rights? Yeah. It just happens. You mm -hmm. don't have to trust anyone. Man, yeah. it's so cool. I love it. <laughs> okay. Uh, last, last up here, we've got our protocol of the month. Uh, so drum roll, please. Kyle, what is our protocol of the month? Yo, our protocol of the month is one I've been a fan of for a long time. This is Unlock Protocol. We actually just had Julian, the founder of Unlock Protocol on our podcast. Uh, it's already out. Go check it out if you haven't, because it is um, a super, super interesting podcast. Um, Julian's been in this space for a while. He's been building companies for a while. And um, 
Unlock Protocol is is unlocking a lot of new things for memberships specifically, but for creators and businesses, et cetera. Um, and basically what it's unlocking is this sort of, so there's a couple things actually that it's unlocking. So one, memberships now become an asset because instead of just like plugging in your credit card and paying monthly, you're, you're buying an NFT and you're still paying monthly for this membership, but that NFT is an asset. And again, if we think about utility and scarcity, which is the theme of this podcast, I think, mm -hmm. um, if you have a scarce amount of memberships, so maybe you only allow a thousand people to sign up for a VIP membership or something, that there's scarcity there. And if there's enough utility towards that scarce membership, that NFT might go up. And so you're paying for this membership and that asset might actually go up in price. So you're, you're actually in this membership and it could be a good investment opportunity for you as well. So that is really cool. But the other thing is the interoperability of NFTs in Web3. And so right now it's very challenging to have a membership cross platform because they don't typically speak to each other, especially mm -hmm. big platforms like Facebook, Instagram, et cetera. And so when it's an NFT and it's in your wallet, well, that wallet connects to everything on the internet. And so now mm -hmm. you can have experiences and access and whatever you want with anything on the internet. And as long as that NFT there is there, that membership, membership NFT, you get the features that um, that you've you've programmed in, and so Unlock um, has built this technology. Out. It's already live and available, and people are using it. It is still a bit clunky. I will warn you there; it is still a bit clunky. Um, but <laughs> they are improving it, just like the Web three world is improving Web three. Um, but uh, a huge unlock, I think, for memberships. And um, I mean, memberships is one of the most popular sort of business models in the world. And I think it's becoming even more and more popular as we go. Um, and I think Unlock Protocol is going to be at the forefront of that um, as we move into Web3. Yeah, and I think what's so exciting about this to me uh, is, and credit to Julian and his team at Unlock Protocol, they are they're big thinkers and they're thinking about systemic change. Uh, they're not just building a, and let's be clear here, they're building a protocol, which means their objective is to not just be direct to consumer, their objective is to also work with other apps who can build apps on top of their protocol. So they're trying to you know, really affect that base layer. Um, but what I love about his approach is, so currently we're in this attention economy when we think about the digital world, right? All of, like our attention is the biggest asset online and most revenue models of businesses online sell our attention for ads. And then even worse, they also have access to a lot of our data, which creates a lot of concerns around privacy and security that we've all come up with, you know, that's come up in the media a lot over the last few years. So there's obviously challenges with this attention economy. Um, nobody likes their attention being sold. Nobody enjoys that experience of like ads all the time on the page trying to grab you, right? Well, wouldn't you rather not face that and the solution to that is the membership economy and that's really what unlock is aiming to build mm -hmm. is wouldn't it be nice if instead of having to go to a platform where it my my attention is being sold to, to ads i can just go to the communities that i value most i can spend time in there with like-minded people i have to pay but by paying I'm actually supporting directly to the expert or artist or business that I care most about. And we create a, an entirely different economy, which I think is much healthier for us as a society and as a humanity. Absolutely. And as a customer, like you pay for it. And then if you don't want to be a part of the membership anymore, you can just sell it. And well, exactly, maybe you yeah. sell it for an appreciating price. But if not, like, let's say you have a half a year left in your membership you can sell that half a year to someone else yeah. or, or trade it, right? Like, yeah. Um, so yeah, lots of cool things. Check out that podcast. Um, it was a, a mind-blowing podcast and I um, was super excited to have him on. Well, that's a wrap, folks. Thanks for tuning in. Wow, I feel like I gotta take a deep breath after that it. one. We made it through the mayhem. <laughs> Thanks for listening. <laughs> As always, Send us a DM. We'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, any thoughts about anything we said today, anything we talked about, uh, want to chat more about it, uh, you can find us on Twitter or even better, join the Web3 Academy Discord where we have hundreds of people talking and discussing these topics on a regular basis. And we're there to answer any questions you have. 
uh, so that we can all learn and we can all grow together and make the world a better place. Have a wonderful, wonderful day, everybody, or week or whatever. Just make it wonderful. Thank you for listening to Web3 Academy. We hope this helps you along your Web3 journey. If it does, please share this episode and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. By the way, if you have yet to join the Discord community, you are missing out. This is where all the magic happens. This is where we learn, where we ask questions, where we network. Uh, You want to be in there. The link to join is in the description below. And finally, a quick disclaimer. Nothing in this podcast was financial advice. Crypto and Web3 can be risky. You can literally lose it all. In fact, if you invest on account of what we say, you probably will lose it all. So don't do that. In all honesty, the point of this podcast is to remove the noise of markets and price and focus on utility and implementation anyway. So you should not take any of this as financial advice. Thank you, friends, and see you in the next one.